All right, you guys, welcome back to Behind the Bikini. We are on episode 43 this week. Um, for those of you that are just joining us, this is going to be a little bit of a different kind of episode this week. This is going to be not so much for our competitors, but for our competitors, friends, and family. So this was something that, um, that Jordan brought to her stories this week, and we got a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of responses. So we wanted to do, address some of these and, and kind of give you guys um, an overview of what it feels like to be in our shoes as competitors and when you're, you guys as family members and friends and things like that come to us and say these things. So this is coming from a place of this is how we feel and this is why we're doing things and things like that so that you can kind of understand it a little bit better. So um, before we do that, like, comment, subscribe, wherever the buttons are. We always do. <laughs> we don't know where the buttons are. Whatever, wherever they are on your device, like, comment, subscribe. Go for it. Um, and, yeah, did you want to add anything onto that, Jordan, before we jump into these, these, uh, these comments and questions? No, I mean, we're coming, we're uh, bringing this topic up today because it was presented to us by one of our listeners. Um, so then I took the topic and posted it on my social media and was asking like, hey, competitors, like, do you agree with this? And what are some other things, you know, within this topic that we we can discuss? And like Sean said, we had a, a lot of feedback. So if you're watching this video, you're either a competitor that is um, you know, kind of feeling the same things and maybe trying to figure out how to navigate it or, you know, how to have those tough conversations with your family, or perhaps you are the family watching and one of your um, loved ones is getting ready to compete or in the process. And what we're trying to um, do is educate you on what that process looks like, what it feels like. And, you know, there are some things where loved ones say something to us sometimes, and it can be a little nerve wracking and we Triggering. want to educate you on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's the you can support. Yeah, that was that was where this came up. It's like this is these are the triggering things for us as competitors, or things that send us into a mental head spin a little bit sometimes, and and it's just you know being able to um, articulate what we want to without making you as our family or friends feel like crap for asking the question. Really, you know what I mean? Because we get it. You don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we're going to dive right into some topics. Yeah, we're going to go right into it. So um, we, we, we pulled up a list of the ones that were kind of the most popular and the most uh, requested or the most um, suggested, that kind of thing. And as we go through each one of these, some of these are going to be relatively similar. Um, but at the same time, we want to give you guys ways of understanding this. So again, this is something where you know, if you're a competitor, you can take what we're saying and take it to your family, or you can let them just watch this podcast and let them let them hear it for themselves too. So um, one of them that came in is why can't you have just one bite or why can't you skip one workout? So this one I think is, is, is a big one. I get it even now, you know, I've been doing this for over 15 years at this point. And, you know, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, like the vulnerable, vulnerable moment here. Uh, we went to D.C. this past weekend for Father's Day. We did a little like staycation. We like to go in for like a night or whatever. And and um, I ate decent, but here's the but. Uh, my husband had had dessert with every meal and uh, I had a bite because he's like, just have a bite. So I fell into that. And then I had to go to my my coach during my check in and say I had bites of dessert. I didn't have a full dessert, but I did have bites of a dessert. And for me, it's like, guess what? Now my, my macros got cut this week for my check-in. So, you know, so what would you say as far as if somebody came up, why can't you have one bite or why can't you skip one workout or what, whatever it may be? What would you tell somebody? Uh, I got a lot of different facets to this. You know, I think the where the person's coming from and saying like, why can't you just have one and why can't you skip just one? They're not really understanding the seriousness of the sport, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, yep. in bodybuilding, you know, there is a reason why there is such a small percent of us that can achieve this goal because mm -hmm. the majority of America cannot even stick to a diet or an exercise med right. regimen for more than a couple of weeks. So where I'm going to say to a normal lifter, you know, healthy person, it is okay to skip a workout right. or have just one bite. But we are in a sport where one bite or one missed workout can take us further from our goals. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, a big part about our sport and being good at our sport is the ability to find discipline right. and being able to say no. And, um, you know, so two facets, this is number one, maybe I don't want to, I don't want to yeah. have a bite. I don't want to mm -hmm. skip my workout today. I'm going to go to my workout and then I'm going to go find you and we're going to hang out later. Um, 
And also too, like, why does me having a bite, why does that make you feel fulfilled if it doesn't make me feel fulfilled? And I think that's where people need to start, you know, kind of looking into the other lens of things. Me taking one bite, why does that satisfy you? Right. And I'm not going to answer that question because I think everybody's going to have a different response to that. But um, that, those would be a couple of things that I would, you know, think about and say. Yeah. And, you know, going back to, um, you know, what happened this with this weekend. So, you know, I had a, had a bite of my husband's d- a dessert and all that kind of stuff. And then the following day, you know, we were having lunch and we were still in D.C. And he's like, oh, when we get home, he's like, we should go to the, the winery. I said, Dan, I said, I need to go train. I said, I haven't I said I haven't been to the gym yet today. I have to go train. I'm not going to the winery. And, you know, so and he's like. Oh, okay. Then I'm going to go train too, <laughs> you know? So, but if I had just given in and been like, okay, let's go, let's go to the winery. Well, guess what? I would be in a really bad place right now. You know what I mean? Like for, for me, you know, yeah, I've got weeks and weeks and weeks till my show, but at the same time, what you do today affects what you do tomorrow. So again, what I did over this weekend affected my check-in this week. So now I'm going to have to pay for it because my macros got cut. So, you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And, you know, it wasn't his fault. He's just trying to have a good time and all that kind of stuff. And I get that. And I understand all that. But when we're talking about getting on a pro stage and being competitive and having a good time, those are two different things. So you have to, as a competitor, make those choices for yourself. It has nothing to do with me wanting to have fun with you or, you know, go out or whatever. I could still have gone out to dinner with my husband and not had that bite bite of dessert and been fine. But I chose to have that bite of dessert. You know, I chose to do that. So, you know, what I would say is, you know, if you're coming at it from a from a place of love, again, as a as a um, uh, a loved one saying something like this to your to your person that's in in prep, just realize that if they tell you no, it's not anything against you. You know, it's not us. You know, trying to be. I don't know, just say, uh, again, it's not anything against you. It's a, it's about us and what we want to do and how, what we want to accomplish, right? It's not us trying to tear you down or knock you down or make you feel worse because you because we don't want to do that with you or whatever it might be. It's not about you. It's about the process that we need to go through as a competitor. Yeah, and as we go through these two, you know, I'm sitting here thinking like, well, <laughs> again, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to put myself in the other person's perspective. Like, right. And I can understand from a family's perspective how you can't just have one bite and how that would maybe equal, this is unhealthy for you. Right. Yes. But if your loved one is considering bodybuilding or in the sport of bodybuilding, I want you to remember that this is a sport. Mm -hmm. So let's say that they were a basketball player. There's going to be team meetups. There's going to be practices. There's going to be a specific diet and exercise regimen. And if they were on a team sport, would you tell them, hey, can you just skip your workout today and tell your coach you want to come hang out with your family? No. Right. And that's why the sport of bodybuilding is even more difficult because it's on me to show up to the gym today. Absolutely. My my coach isn't right there in the gym holding my hand, making sure I do everything. So for someone that's also newer to this, if they do skip one workout, it's very easily the next day to go, well, then I'll just go skip another. So sometimes it's just about keeping them on that track. And so as I'm, like I said, as I'm sitting here thinking, and as we keep diving into these things, it's not disordered. It can be disordered. Of course, Mm -hmm. anybody can take anything to any extreme, but it's again about finding that discipline. And this is an extreme sport. It has Mm -hmm. every facet into it. It has physical activity. It has nutrition. It has mental. It has posing. It has all these things that we don't think about. And some competitors can be in the gym up to three hours a day, deep, deep, Mm -hmm. deep in their prep. So just wanted to caveat that as well as we were getting ready to. Right. And you can kind of relate this to, to, you know, we're talking about like basketball sports and things like that. You know, you can relate it to something that's an individual sport like boxing or MMA or wrestling or whatever. It's all the same thing, like the same concepts. So if you can't wrap your head around bodybuilding being a sport, think of it something like it's an MMA or a wrestling thing. You know, that's one of the reasons why my husband and I did really well with all of this because he was a wrestler. So he gets it. He understands the, the, the mentality of it that you have to be all in. And the diet is a huge part of it too, trying to make weight and things like that. So that's all part of it, right? So at the end of the day, like we have to be 100% in just like a, a, a top level athlete in any other sport, you know? So, um, so there's that one. Let's go on to the next one, which is you looked better before. <laughs> so I'm going to let you take the lead on this one. Go ahead. Yeah, I've, I've heard this one a lot. Mm-hmm. And this one, I'm just going to be honest, it's, it's, gut, it's gut-wrenching mm-hmm. um, when you hear that. Um, 
we are in the sport of bodybuilding where we are looking at our bodies and having people look at our bodies, our coaches, our spot, whatever, 24 yeah. seven. And I can promise you that no one is harder on our physique than we are That's in right. this sport. Um, and everybody is entitled to their opinion, 100%. Um, I also want to caveat to the loved one listening that when you see your loved one who is competing, that is very close to stage, none of us here have agree that that look is sustainable Correct. all year. Correct. It is temporary. Mm -hmm. It is not forever. It is the stage lean conditioning is meant for a show. And then the purpose is once you are done competing, that you put on some body fat and look a little bit more normal and healthy or whatever that means to you. Um, so when someone says you looked better before, I understand that because, again, there's only such a small percent of us that can do this sport. And seeing your loved one very lean where you could see every single muscle and sometimes for the people that are new to the sport that don't have a lot of muscle yet, they can look a little bit just thin, just mm -hmm. skinny. Yeah. And that is concerning to you because in America, we associate that look with a disordered eating habit. Right. Mm -hmm. So what all I could say is when you say something like this, it's not helpful and it is not kind. It makes us feel like all of our hard work, number one is for nothing. Right. Uh, number two, we don't feel supported. And then mm -hmm. number three, we just don't feel like now that we look good. good and we maybe don't to you, but for our sport, this is what is needed in order to do well, place, et cetera. It's just part of our criteria. Yep. Um, so if you have that opinion, which I'm going to say a lot of you will, a lot yeah. of you will not like the way that your loved one looks when they are close to stage, maybe just hold that comment to yourself and have a um, conversation about it when the show is over. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, this is what my feelings were. I was concerned. This is why. And come from more of a place of like, can we have a conversation about this versus just like a one sentence comment, no conversation about it that just leaves me interpret interpreting what I feel like you meant. Right, right. And I will also say on that regard, most of us, not all of us, but most of us don't like the way we look when we're getting close to the stage as well. Like we understand it's not sustainable, but we also understand that that's not our favorite look, right? My favorite look is right about now where I'm about 12 weeks out from my show. I've got a little bit of tightness going on, but I've still got some fullness and some roundness, but I'm still 10 pounds off from where I have to be to be on stage. That's, that's the level that you have to get to for the sport, right? It's not, it's, in general, most of us, not everybody, but most of us don't want to look how we look on show day. Most of us don't. So by you piling on, that just makes it worse. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't like looking at myself and seeing my hard jawline and seeing the veins going through everywhere. Like it's cool. Like it's cool. Like in a science, science experiment kind of cool. Like it's fun to see that kind of stuff happen, but I like having an ass. I like having, I like having some fullness and some roundness to my cheeks, you know, and both, both cheeks, <laughs> you know? So I like myself better that way too, you know? So by saying something, just, just verbalizing that to us, it doesn't help. It doesn't help, you know? And we're very aware. We're very aware of what our physique looks like because we check in every week. I was going to say, if there's one sport where you are <laughs> yeah. very self-aware, I yes. promise you it's this one. That's right. I, I promise you it is this sport. Yes. You know, great examples. Again, I checked in with my coach today, sent in my videos and, you know, this is how hyper-focused we are. And again, we're 12 weeks out. She said, you dropped your glutes during your transition and you're posing. Like that's how hyper-focused we are on this. And I'm 12 weeks out from a show. I'm not, I'm not like getting on stage tomorrow. So again, it's, these are the things that we are very, very aware of. We're very, very aware of, of what we look like and things like that. We just don't need it to be reiterated. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because the, the, the truth of the matter is, is if we have a really good, um, you know, reverse and off season, things like that, most of the time we're healthier, we look better, we're all of that stuff when we're in off season than we ever would have been if we ever started the sport. I was just about to say that. Yeah. yeah. Before body, but I mean, I was definitely overweight. I yeah. was in I was in the realm. I just wasn't taking care of myself. I was taking right. care of everybody else and all of my clients. I was an yep. in-person personal trainer building my gym at the time. And when I found bodybuilding, I was not healthy myself. I was talking mm -hmm. the talk. I wasn't walking the walk. Yeah. And my lab work was terrible. Um, I would never go back 
to the way that I was before. You know, people ask all the time, like, how do you find the motivation and discipline every day to do this? And it's like, now this is just a part of me. Like, I don't just wake up and like, sure, there's days I don't want to do cardio, but in my off season, I just woke up and did cardio because that's just mm-hmm. what I do. It's just now my lifestyle. So it's my choice now. Um, yep. But again, I, I I love my stage le- like lean look. Again, I, I work very hard for it, but it is not sustainable all year long. And I know that. And that's yes. why in off seasons, we have these fluctuations. So yes, absolutely. You know, and so again, it's just a matter of just kind of tempering. And like you said, Jordan, you know, when, when, when you're out of that show prep, then you can kind of have that conversation and come to come from a place of trying to understand, trying to get it, you know, versus you look, you look better before you did all this crap to your body. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> well, what if somebody said that to you, right? right. You know, right. maybe I'm listening, maybe you're feeling a little bit insecure. Everybody, every time that I'm on a consult call with a lifestyle client, a non-competitor, they're like, I love the way that I felt and look in my 20s. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, what if somebody came up to you and you're in your 40s was like, hey, I liked you better when you looked when you were 20s. And you're like, oh, all right, well, I can't do anything about that. I get like, that's just never a good comment. So again, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Yeah, so kind of that's a it. huge point there too, because you would never go up to somebody who's overweight and be like, you looked better before. <laughs> <laughs> you would never do that. It's such a, it's such a double standard when, when in reality, as you know, bodybuilding sport, yes, it gets to an extreme, but we're probably some of the healthiest people on the planet when it comes to just daily routine type stuff. You know, again, not going as far as extreme for stage, but just in general, we are, we take care of ourselves way better than the majority of people out there. So it's like, it's just so funny when you say it like that, because you would never have that flipped. You would never go up to somebody who's gotten overweight and, and tell them you looked better before when you were skinny. No. And, and it is a double do standard, but it's an unaware. An right. Unaware yeah, yeah, yeah. Double standard. Yeah. Our yeah, absolutely. It's Which like, it's like why we're creating this. Podcast. Right, exactly. Because it's like, sometimes you don't even think about it that way, you know, right. and, that, and I didn't even think about it until you mentioned that. I was like, that makes complete sense. Like you would never go up to somebody that was overweight and say they looked better when they were skinny. No. <laughs> like you wouldn't do that. You would like, never. No. You would never. So, you know, that, that, that just, again, just kind of put yourself in that, that competitor's shoes and how hard they're working to look that way. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's deflating when you come up and say something like that. It's deflating. That's it. Deflating. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So on that same topic is the concept of you look skinny. Are you starving yourself? Love Um, this one. (laughs) No, right. And I will say some preps are bad. You know, we know that there are some preps that are very bad and they are starving themselves. I take over clients sometimes with preps that are on terrible nutrition programs. That does happen hundred percent. So I don't want to like say that this is not a thing, but if you're doing things right, if you're doing it from a healthy standpoint, like we always try to preach on this podcast and things like that, you're not starving yourself, right? We're doing things very strategic. Again, it's very strategic to create a specific look. But I can tell you this, I've mentioned this a few times, being with FitBody, my macros, my lowest that my macros get to now is still higher than some of the past programs that I was on in off season. Like, I was like what I was eating, you know, going into peak week this last year with Hawaii and Japan was what I was eating in off season with a previous coach. So again, there are some bad pro- programs out there, but if you're doing it right and you've got a good team behind you, got good coaches behind you, things like that, you can get to the stage. You don't have to starve yourself. You don't have to do that. Looking skinny. Yeah. Because we're getting rid of body fat. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're doing. That's the whole thing. We're showing what we sculpted underneath. We're taking that boulder and we're chipping away to get to our statue that we've built underneath the, the body fat. So yeah, to you, we look skinny, but in reality, we're just dropping the body fat. And really when we're talking about, you know, um, divisions like bikini, we're still, we've still got a good, you know, anywhere from 12, 15% body fat. We're not getting sub 10. If you're getting b- below 10, 10% body fat as a bikini competitor, you are too low. You're too low. We've still got a decent amount of body fat on us. You know, it's just distributed differently. So, yeah. And I think words matter here, right? Like it's, you know, you look skinny. Yes, we are going to look skinny Mm -hmm. in our world or in our sport. We use the term lean, like Mm -hmm. we are lean. Um, So maybe just learning, you know, different verbiage, different words and what those, you know, mean to us. Um, I also love the, are you starving yourself? And again, this goes back to, are you with a good coach and are you doing it in a healthy way? Um, 
I'll say this for any contest preparation, any contest preparation, we know at a point it becomes a little unhealthy. About mm -hmm. six weeks out from that show, that athlete is on very high cardio, uh, low food for them. Everything's relative here, right? Whether yes. you start at 3,000 calories or 1,000 calories for a prep, yes. it's going to be low at any point for any athlete. Um, at that time, because body fat is so low, internally, things are changing. Mm -hmm. Hormones are changing. A lot of normal signals are being downregulated. That can make us more emotional, things like that. But so at any point in prep, there is a point where it becomes unhealthy. But a coach, a good coach, should be able to guide you through that process and post-show get you back. We call it the rebound, mm -hmm. a good reverse diet and a rebound. But I will say, for a, a person that hires a great coach and that has a good off season or a good starting point, we are probably eating more food and calories than you do in a day. Absolutely. And healthier as well. So it gets me really agitated about that because some people say that, like, are you starving? And I'm like, dude, I'm eating 2000 calories. I'm just mm -hmm. eating chicken and rice. And to you, that's starving because that's diet food. But to me, I'm eating 2000 calories and I'm fueling with nutrient dense whole foods. Um, so again, it's perspective here, right? So again, it depends on, you know, where we're at to, to you know, poke at the person and say, are you starving? Because they probably are hungry, mm -hmm. close to the show. Yep. Um, but for most that do it right, still when they're hungry and close to show, they're still eating more than you are in a day. Yeah. And that's the, that is, that right there is the biggest thing that I have to deal with, like when I'm bringing on new clients, because nine times out of 10, they are not eating enough. They're eating sub a thousand calories. Yes. And they want to jump into a contest prep right away. And I'm like, no, because I don't have anywhere to pull from. Correct. You're not even, you're not even eating enough to sustain your current body mass, let alone try to pull anything and diet off of you. And these are people that are just surviving and living in a normal, normal life. You know, you would be surprised how many, and again, I only work with females, I don't work with males. So you'd be surprised how many women in our society today are not eating enough food, period. Yeah, well, not what eating. has society taught us? Don't eat. Starve which yourself. Is, which is why we're here, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, our loved ones are in that older generation where it yep. was told. Um, and then it goes back to your point too, Sean, about, you know, you just talked about, you know, your coaching style, but some coaches would take that athlete right. at a thousand calories and put through a contest prep for dirt cheap, just to, for the money. Yep. And Unfortunately, that happens a lot because we have a lot of people that are coming into the sport in their late 20s, or I'm sorry, early 20s. You know, they're young, they don't have a lot of money, whatever the case is, and they can only afford X amount for a coach, but you get what you paid for, right? Absolutely. So I think a question maybe to the to your person that is, you know, doing this contest prep, if you're feeling this way, is tell me about your coach. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your process. How much are you eating right now? You know, yeah. what does this look like? Do you, maybe if you're willing to help them and support them, oh, okay, you need help with a new coach? Like, I will help you with X amount to help you find yeah. a new coach, a better coach. Like, let me help you. Let me support you. I know a lot of parents that have supported their children that, you know, come out of a high school sport and they don't want to play in college. What do they do now? Bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, or they come out of a college sport. What do they do now? Bodybuilding. And that same amount of money that they took from those high school collegiate sports, now they're just helping their kid fund their bodybuilding right. journey. Yeah. Um, and I love that because yep. that puts the parents with a stake in the game. They still understand. So, you know, maybe just kind of taking a step back and asking those questions to that loved one that maybe you're concerned about. Like, tell me about your coach. What are you eating? Does this feel healthy to you? Are you happy with your experience? Can I help support you in any way if you're not happy? Um, and then that's that opens up that dialogue again. Yes. Communication everything. Yeah. Coming from a place of love versus coming from a place of judgment. You know, there's, like you said, the words matter, how you ask, you know, how you deliver the message, 100% makes a difference. So if you are, you know, if you're a loved one of a competitor and you're concerned, come at it from a place of concern versus you look skinny. You know, there's, there's, there's two different ways to do that, right? So just come at it from a place of concern and say, like, I want to buy, I want buy-in. I want to be a part of this with you. You know that kind of thing, and then it comes from a better, a better place, a better, a place of love versus Correct. versus you know just what are you doing, you know yes. that kind of thing. So, next one again, this goes into the same kind of concept of don't don't keep losing more weight. What we were just talking about before, and you know you got to remember again, again I think the the caveat to use with all of these questions is these are all based upon if you have a good coach and a good prep. You know, if, if you don't, that again that does happen, right? So a lot of the stuff that we're saying here, it's if you are on a good plan. Right. Because we want to make sure that that's very clear that, that it does happen, that there's bad plans out there. hundred percent. 
Um, but when it comes to don't keep losing more weight, you know, people are shocked when I tell them how much I actually weigh. You know, when I look my my like right now, like in my off season, and again, I'm still like 10, 12 pounds over my stage weight. I'm 150 pounds. I'm a big girl. You know, I'm not I'm not skinny. I'm not skinny. I wear a size two to four in in pants. You know, but I'm I'm solid. You know, it's not weight. It's muscle. You know, and it's you're going to look completely different when you have a different body composition. And then on the other flip side of that, I see women that have relatively same, the same measurements that I do, relatively the same height, things like that. They may be a good 20 pounds less than me because they don't have the muscle mass that I have. Right. It's not weight. It's what that weight is comprised of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, you know, that don't keep losing more weight like that also makes the athlete question like, am I doing the right thing? And right. just like you said, like we're, we're assuming at this point that people are working with a coach and that that coach is guiding them and kind of telling them, Hey, this is where you're at. And this is where I want you to be about X more pounds. Mm -hmm. um, I've been experiencing this a lot. And one of my, one of my athletes come to mind right away and her husband keeps poking at her and she is lean. And, mm -hmm. and he keeps saying like, Hey, like you're too skinny. You're too skinny. You're too skinny. And I'm like, yes, yeah, she is. But it's the look for For stage. stage. And I think that's where people really need to understand that. We are not just dropping weight. We're just not going into the gym to lose eight, five to eight pounds and feel better. We are stepping on stage for a competition that has a criteria. It's a bodybuilding show. We have to be able to get lean enough to be able to see the muscle <clears throat> underneath the body fat and the skin. So to the eye, going back to our very first question, to you, it is going to look extreme. Mm -hmm. To us in our sport, that athlete looks perfect. She right. looks where she should be. Um, again, going back to now the question before, if that that person is working with a good coach and you have had that conversation with your loved one and they love their coach, they're you know bought in on the process, they think everything's going good, somehow you have to find that trust in your loved one that is participating in this and understand that they have had that communication with their coach, the coach knows what that person needs to bring to stage and they're going to be doing it in the most healthy way. So saying don't lo keep losing more weight, but their coach is telling them you need to drop another five to eight pounds. Imagine what that puts your loved one that's competing in that position. Mm -hmm. They love you so much and there mm -hmm. is no one that's going to trump an opinion over a spouse or a parent more than the coach. Right. But then they have their coach that they know is the professional that they've hired to guide them through this process. That's telling them you need to lose another five to eight pounds. Now they're stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm. So again, it's where we have to kind of create the care team of the athlete, right? You have to be the support, the listener, making sure that they're doing this in a healthy way, concerned. Those are things are all valid. But once that you find that the athletes bought in and you all trust this coach, you all have to be bought into that plan and let it ride. Right. Saying something like this just puts us in a very awkward position because mm -hmm. we love you. We, we appreciate your feedback, but we know that we have to keep going in order to progress that goal. And we don't want to disappoint our coach. We don't want to disappoint our loved ones. And now, as you can see, it's just the cyclic cycle of, of what shit storm we can create from this. Right. Right. And also on this topic, because I, I had my check in today, so I wanted to read what was at the bottom of my check in um, so that you guys can get an idea of what a coach is going to say to you. Right. So it says I can see body composition is changing. I want to see even more this year. I'd really like to bring in some more extreme conditioning so that when we fill out, we've got a little bit harder, drier look. Right. That is from my coach. That is telling me my conditioning needs to be better this year than it has been in years past. Right conditioning versus weight loss. What that translates to is I need to get more body fat off of me than I have in the past, but I also realize that she's saying, so we can fill you out and give you a little bit harder, drier look. You also got to realize I'm masters, which tend to be a little bit more, a little bit harder, a little bit drier, a little bit fuller, um, or a little bit more muscle maturity, that kind of thing too. So these are the words that we're getting from our coaches as far as what we need to do to get into stage shape. Nope. She didn't say anything about weight. She said conditioning, right? So you got to realize our vernacular here in this sport is different, right? So what you equate to weight loss is not the same thing that we are seeing. It's not the same thing that we are trying to create, right? It's not actually weight. It's body fat. It's two different things.
right? So just to, to kind of give like a, a real example of what we hear as far as competitors. And you as a, as a normal person may not understand what conditioning means, that's okay. You can say, hey, what does that actually mean? And hopefully the competitor will, will explain that to you and give you a little bit better of, a, of an idea of what conditioning means, which we've done several times here on the podcast. <laughs> so, um, but again, that goes back to, we have a different set of eyes. We have a different set of vocabulary. We have a different set of things that we are trying to do versus the normal, the normal human being. <laughs> Gosh, that's a great point, you know, is that we, in this sport, in the bikini criteria, we're assuming most of us are in the bikini criteria mm -hmm. in our women's divisions. Uh, we don't have a weight that we have to weigh in at, at a check-in. Um, for bikini, it's about a look. Yep. Um, we have a specific set of criteria, specific amount of neat, um, leanness, how they want our muscles to look, how they want the tan to look, all of that. But what we don't have is a body weight. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the question all the time, especially from first time competitors and their families is, well, what's the weight going to be? And we don't know. That's right. I, as a coach for the first time competitor that I've never put through a contest prep before, I truly have no idea oh, yeah. what there's weight's going to be until I get them on stage the first, sometimes not even the first time. It takes a few times to know mm -hmm. what that state weight's going to be. And sometimes that can be a little mentally taxing for the first time athlete. They're like, I don't know what number I'm achieving. And right. I'm like, I think it's going to be another four to five pounds, but it could be about four to six pounds. Yeah. We're just going to have to see. Yep. So it, it, that is a very great point is that, you know, it gets a little confusing because we're not chasing a, a number on the scale where yeah. most people in a weight loss phase are like, I want to get to X amount of weight. And when I get to X amount of weight, I'm done. And that's not, not what the sport looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, w w are we going to keep losing more weight? Yeah, probably. But the uh, coach should be able to respond back to the athlete about how much or what they're looking for. Hey, yeah. I know we're going to be ready when you hit your back shot. I could see your tie-ins etched out right now. They're just very faint. So we can give that feedback, but we don't necessarily know what the weight is when we see that feedback come through. Right. You know, and, and a good example is even the opposite direction. So I just had a check in this week where I have a girl in, in off season and I want her gaining size. So she's putting down goals, you know, every week that she wants to hit for certain things, everything like that. And she's like, these are my, these are my individual goals. I said, great. I said, the one I'm not okay with is she put a weight, a weight gain goal. Like as far as she wants to gain a half a pound to a pound a week, I said, no, that's, that's not how this works. Like your body doesn't do that. You know, like I'm looking at a look, I'm looking at an overall shape. I'm looking at an overall, you know, this, and I, said, I don't want you to put a strict number on this because if you do that, you're going to fail because it doesn't, it doesn't go in a straight line. First of all, when it comes to weed and it just, it's just not, that's just not how it works. It's just not how it works. Gaining weight and losing weight does not go in a straight line as far as adding muscle, dropping body fat, all this. It does, it doesn't, just doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? So we, we specifically in this industry stay away from specific weights, you know, Our this is, number. Yeah, right. It's just a number. They can change if you didn't poop that day. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it, there's, or you had a little bit more sodium or you dropped a little bit of water or whatever. It can you had change. a heavy workout. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All of those things affect your weight. So it does not make, make you a failure or a success. The same concept here when we're talking about, you know, are you going to lose any more weight? You know, cause that can, that can be really, really difficult right here when you're looking at the scale. So correct. <clears throat> okay. So, um, next one is once you're done, will you be able to eat again? <laughs> so, um, I eat all the time. I don't know about you. <laughs> like, I eat all the time. I just put up a picture of my breakfast yesterday in my stories on Instagram. And I can't tell you how many people messaged me and were like, you eat all of that for breakfast. <laughs> Yeah, I have six ounces of chicken. I have a bagel, a cinnamon raisin bagel. I have a banana. I have yogurt and I have dates. That's my breakfast every single morning. I eat a lot. My breakfast is like 800 calories or something like that. I, it's, it is my biggest meal of the day. Um, but I, I'm always eating. And I'm eating, I'm eating good foods. We're going to get into this a little bit too when we're talking about the next question as we go along here. But I, I'm never not eating. Like even when I'm in, in peak week and things like that, and even when I'm depleting through, you know, the last few weeks, I'm still eating a lot of food. It's still a lot of food. It's just I'm not going to this, going to the um, Mexican restaurant and eating chips and salsa. You know, that's that's not what I'm doing. But I'm still eating a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm still eating. 
I'd just like to take I a moment to welcome our new channel partners, Prozis. If you are unfamiliar with them, go ahead and go down into my description box now, click on the link, go check out their site. They are the leading supplement sports nutrition company based out of Portugal, been around for 17 years. You might be asking what makes Prozis unique? Well, everything that they make is made in-house or with trusted partners. They have to go through rigorous testing in Portugal in order to even get any products on the market. So what you're gonna find, you're gonna find really high quality pure supplementation and one of the biggest things for me is I have some GI issues so being able to eat some of these more healthy protein treats and things like that and not have any gut issues oh worth its weight in gold go check them out click on the link in my description box below use the code cuties10 to get all of your discounts and even some special surprises they're always putting out some amazing promotions let them know that I sent you and let me know what you think thanks again for watching and thank you for supporting our channel now Go optimize your own athletic abilities and check out prozis.com. I agree. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to, you know, I think people underestimate the amount that we're actually taking in as bodybuilders. You know, we uh -huh. eat a lot. I eat five meals a day. I eat the same five meals every single day. And um, yeah, there are times where I'm deep in prep and I'm hungry. Like that yeah. is part of the sport. Part of the sport is the hunger. Can you make it through? Right. Um, so yeah, this one nerves me because I, I am eating. I, I'm yeah. eating probably again more than you do during the day. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of people have like a breakfast and then they like don't eat all day and then they'll go, you know, binge at night on like a dinner, or, like going out to eat. Like that's that's society societal acceptance, but right. me eating five meals a day out of Tupperware is not, right? So yes, you're you're your athlete that you know should be eating. Um, again, if not, or starving, or like one or two meals a day, like look back at the coaching, and that's where we, you know, go back to that open conversation. Uh, there was another guy. There was another thought I had about this when you were talking, which was a good one. Um, but yes, <laughs> it, they that uh, we we are eating. Yes. Um, well, that goes into the next one because I think we can pull this next one up. It's it's the um, our, I'm sure you can't wait to eat real food. So I always find this one hilarious because what we eat as, as bodybuilders is real food. You yeah, know? Well, I just want everyone to pause for a second. Right? Yeah. And like what, when somebody says that, what do you mean by that? Yeah. What, what is, what is the definition to that person of real food? Mm -hmm. Right. Because my definition of real food is probably different than yours talking to the person that doesn't compete. And that's why you feel the same about my food. And I don't, I don't understand that real food comment. Mm -hmm. And when we really take a thing, a step back on that, I want, I think everyone would feel the same. Does that really make sense? Because yeah. all food is real food. Mm -hmm. Every single thing that you can put into your mouth and eat, yep. even an object could be considered food and it is real. It's tangible. Mm -hmm. So what do we actually mean? I think the translation when people say this is when can you eat the way that I want you to eat or the way right. that I eat? Yep. Yep. And again, why does that affect you, what I put into my mouth? Right. Do you get the same satisfaction when I'm eating your meal? Right. It's very interesting when you really think about the psychology behind that. Yep. I think a lot of it, honestly, I think a lot of it comes down to marketing. I really do. Because we see these commercials in our face all day, every day about this restaurant, that restaurant, this new food, that new food. It, that's not how humans have been for the majority of the time humans have been around <laughs> like you know we we survive on on meat and dairy and poultry and 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 vegetables, vegetables and you know the things that come out of the Greens. ground the things that come out of the earth you know things that, that that are perishable things that spoil not things that are stuck on a grocery store shelf for years and are still okay to eat you know what i mean it's in cans that's not how we've that's not how we survived as a as a species for hundreds of thousands of millions of years or how long ago we've been here who knows <laughs> you know what i mean like that's just that's just not it's just not how we've ever been the first thing that i tell people when they come to me as a client whether they are competition lifestyle whatever the easiest way to start eating healthy is when you go to the grocery store go to the outside perimeter of the grocery store and only buy food on the outside perimeter of the grocery store I see because that that's that's the stuff that's perishable that's the stuff that has one to three ingredients in it if it has anything more than three ingredients in it, there's a bunch of preservatives or sugar or starch or whatever, fillers, whatever it might be, which again, not a bad thing. That's still real food. That's still real food. But we as bodybuilders, 
are sticking to those one, two ingredient foods. And that's it. And that's it. And then we're, we're eating the stuff that comes directly from a farm. Yeah. And I think sometimes too, that what they mean too is the restaurants, you know, yeah. everybody misses the athlete misses it too. I can assure you that mm -hmm. going out to eat with their husband or their parents mm -hmm. and having yeah. Of course they do. But again, we know this when we sign up for this process that we're not going to be able to do those things. Right. And I think that's hard on the family, especially for someone that just is competing for the first time because they see their per their person go through such an extreme change. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you guys were going out to eat once or twice a week and then that athlete all of a sudden just says, nope, I'm not doing that. And you yeah. didn't have time to almost mourn losing them at the dinner table or that process. So I understand that. Truly, I understand that place and where people come from with the restaurants. Um, however, a good coach really sets up that communication in the beginning to that athlete of this is what this looks like and this is what it's going to take. And I know for me personally and for my athletes that struggle, they miss going out to restaurants or that event and being able to just relax and have a drink or order a steak and a potato at, at the meal and not have Tupperware in their face. I get it. I do. Yeah. But again, we signed up for this and That's this right. is the commitment to the sport. So, you know, there should be structured refeeds within a prep and things like that, that help that process. But the way that you can kind of support that athlete as well, being a spouse or a parent is saying like, can I spend time with you without food around? Mm -hmm. like how, you know, food doesn't have to be the center of, a, of an That's event. Right. You can go have coffee with them. My dad and I do that all the time. Yes. We go and we just go have coffee together and it's great. Um, go walk around the beach together. There's so many other things that you can still have time with that person that doesn't have to be with the food. So really ask yourself, if I'm, am I trying to eat a meal with this person or am I trying to spend time with them? Because yep. most of the time you just want to spend time with them and yep. you guys can both go eat dinner separately and then go meet up and do something together and spend that time with each other. Or, and there will be a time that they can go back to the restaurant. I promise. Yeah, and there's but there's also compromise here too because I know when I go out, like I, I take my food scale with me and I can order from a restaurant. I can order without the without the oils and all that kind of stuff. I can get just plain fish. I can get just plain chicken. I can get a salad and I can go to dinner with you. Just don't look at me funny when I pull my food scale out <laughs> and put it on the table and measure my proteins, you know, because I do that. And I'll be honest, like I said, vulnerable moment this past weekend, I didn't do that. I just eyeballed my, my, my portions 13 weeks after my show. I was like, I could do this. Guess what? I'm paying for it with my check-in this week. Like I said, you know, but with that said, when I get into prep, I do, I take my little food scale and I stick it in my purse and it comes with me. And then that way I can still enjoy those times out with you and I can still stay on plan too. Just don't make fun of me when I pull my food scale out of my purse and stick it on Absolutely. the table. You know, uh, what I do, this is just a little, a little restaurant hack. What I do is again, I order everything plain and I ask them to bring me a separate plate because what I do is I take out my little scale. I have a foldable collapsible scale that fits into my purse. It's like this big, it fits in my purse and I open it up on the table, stick it on the table, put the plate on top of it, take the protein off and whatever the dish is and weigh it. I mean, it's either that or I don't go to dinner, you know? Right. So, you know, have a compromise, have a compromise, be okay with, with your competitor being, you know, bringing their food scale with them, you know, bring, yes. go, go on Amazon. There's collapsible food scales that you can get. You can stick them right in your purse and take them with you. If it's in my little, my little Dolce Gabbana purse, it's this big. If it's inside, we're good. Yeah. So, yep. And I used to do this with my dad all the time in the, in the beginning, I would bring my food scale and he would be so embarrassed. Yeah. What are you doing? What, and now I pull the food scale out. We're having a conversation. He doesn't even flinch. He just keeps mm -hmm. going and it doesn't even bother him anymore. So when I say this, like my family has also experienced this Correct. and yes. my loved ones have, I have been through this. I've been through the ringer. I've had these tough conversations. I've had these arguments. I, th this is through years of Sean and I's experience that we yep. can come here today and, and help guide you guys through this. But we've been through our own trials and tribulations, but it will get better on both parties. The yeah. athlete will learn how to react with the family and the family will learn how to accept and react with the athlete the more that they stay committed to the sport. And I think also kind of going back to what we talked about with the, you would never go up to somebody that's overweight and say, you know, you looked better before. I think it's also funny in this regard where if somebody goes to a restaurant or something and they order things because they have a food allergy, it's totally acceptable, right? But it's not if it were doing it for a physique goal, right? That's a great point. 
you know, so it's like, it's like, oh, because you're doing it for a bodybuilding competition, it's not as valid because you're not allergic to it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, when so, you ask for no butter, oil, whatever, and they're like, right. are you, are, do you have an allergy? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. To say yes right now because if I don't, are you going to put it on there? I know. Like, what does that really mean? Like, yeah, I know. I'm allergic to it. I don't want butter, oil on my food. Yeah. Like, but yeah, you're, you're 100% correct. Why is and you're that right. taboo? I say that to my waiters. I tell them I'm allergic. Because I know that I know I'm not gonna get anything on my food. <laughs> I think that they actually like clean the grill when you say yes. They, yeah. A lot of places have like a separate grill. They have to because food allergies are just so prevalent now. Mm -hmm. And some of them are really, really serious, you know. So it's like they they literally have to have like a separate spot to cook those things and everything so that you don't you don't have them mixed in with anything else. Contaminate. Yeah, yeah there you go. Contaminate, that's the word right there. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Next one is, do you have an eating disorder? Oh, that's fun, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, I have an eating disorder because I eat healthy, like a, like a person's supposed to eat, you know? So I think in general, I think this sport can trigger some eating disorders. I think it absolutely can. Um, but I think it can also help people that have eating disorders too. I find this happens a lot. Um, a lot of times it just happens, it's just about, and I hate to say it this way, but it's the truth, being able to control that. Because a lot of times when we have, issues or addictions or whatever it may be. It's not about ever being cured from that addiction or that disorder. It's about being able to manage it. It's about being able to be in control of it. And I think a lot of times in this, in this space in bodybuilding, I think it really helps people control that problem, you know, put them in a space where they feel like they have the control over it. So you know, there's, I, I'm not going to say this doesn't trigger people that, that, that have eating disorders or doesn't create problems for some people, just like anything else in life. Anything you go into could create a problem, but it's all in how you manage it, right? It's all in how, it, all in how you manage it. And, and you have to be, you have to go into this with your eyes open, you know, versus just saying, you know, I, I see this a lot too. Again, I know you do too, seeing, you know, clients come in from other coaches and things like that, that are on terrible programming, um, that are starving themselves, that are doing all those kinds of things. It exists. It does exist, like we said before. But we can find ways to get you to a healthy point through this sport. I know I've been on really terrible programming in the past where it was. It was like, it was like I was starving myself. I never stuck with that because it was just I knew this wasn't, I knew it was, it was not right. Like I knew it wasn't, it was temporary. So I would always go back to eating normal, you know, when that was over, I didn't have the propensity to have an eating disorder in that regard. But when this is done correctly, again, how we do it through macros and taking, having autonomy and control over what you're eating and things like that, it can actually help, I think in, in that regard. Yeah, I agree. I've seen a lot of different cases of this. I've seen a lot of women that come to the sport after ED, being recovered from an ED. That is one of my number one questions when I'm on a consult call and someone shares with me that they've had an eating disorder in the past. And my first question back to them is, how have you healed from that? Yeah. What were the steps yeah. that you took? Um, because it can trigger those disordered habits again. I'm not gonna uh -huh. sit here and lie to anyone and say that right. I wouldn't. However, in most cases of a person with a history of an eating disorder that have taken the proper steps through therapy or an eating disorder program to heal, they actually thrive in this sport. I've said it on this podcast and I will continue to say it. If somebody has an eating disorder, I would rather them have disordered eating by eating healthy yeah. and choosing to eat 100%. versus the opposite. So if yep. they're going to choose one over the other, hey, I would rather have them be obsessed about tracking and fueling their body with nutrition, dense whole foods than the latter. I think to me that's, a, that's a better switch. Um, could it cause a disordered eating? I think that depends. I think that that depends on everybody's um, perception of what disordered eating is. Mm -hmm. I will always now from the sport have a very large awareness of how I eat and what I put into my body, even way after competing is over. Is mm -hmm. that a bad thing? I don't think so. I think that that gives me, again, awareness to stay healthy even way after the stage is over. Mm -hmm. um, but to someone else, that could be disordered eating because I'm probably going to track some sort of macros or protein goal through the rest of my life. And to someone else, that could be too, too much. Yep. So again, I think it's perception here. Mm -hmm. um, but if competing does start to, you know, spark this, what I call all or nothing mentality, and I had preps like that where I did not eat one gram off, I did not go out to eat, I completely hermited myself, that can cause issues long term. And that mm -hmm. maybe 
to be something that needs to be looked at, which I did with my husband. I remember my husband said, Jordan, your 100% is someone's 150%. Like you can back off a little bit and still make progress. And I was like, back off. What do you mean? (laughs) You know? So that was a disorder. I had to be so like hermited, just eat, breathe, sleep, train. That's it. That's all I would do. That was not healthy. That's not sustainable either, but it takes time to understand that balance. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with that hundred percent. And, you know, like, again, going back to, I, I don't think that bodybuilding really can cause an eating disorder, but I think people, again, perception have a propensity of it inside themselves where they are a control freak of some form or fashion. And this could potentially pull it out. You know what I mean? If, does that make sense? Absolutely. If it's, you know, if it's not bodybuilding, something else will make will it trigger. Right. So it's something, it's just it's something that's, that lies inside of you. So like you said, I would rather you be in a, in a situation where you can control and manage it and you have the education, you have everything behind you, you have the support behind you to keep you in a healthy place with it versus, versus just going off the rails on your own. And most people that are in this sport and successful at this sport, if everyone can think about themselves or the person that they love that's involved in this sport are type A personalities. Yeah. They're I'm organized. Just- they like to be in control. They like to plan. They like to get, yep. that's how you thrive in this sport. If you don't, you're going to learn real quick how mm-hmm. you have to, you know, be on a schedule and be very detailed. Yep. Um, so that control factor, in my opinion, is a form of a disorder, right? Obsessive yeah. impulse. I, I was diagnosed with OCD as a kid. That helps me now with bodybuilding, right? Yeah. So there's all, we all have some sort of disorder or ism or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Is it helping us or is it hindering us? Are we tapping into those good tools and using them for our advantage or are they hurting us? Mm -hmm. I think that's the question that we need to take a step back back and ask ourselves. Are we doing this and is it hurtful or is it being helpful? Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. And I think, you know, again, going back to, I think that we all, we all have a little bit of crazy in us somewhere. It's just a matter of, I know I do. We're all crazy. It's just a matter of how it comes out. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So do you make your family suffer or eat the same things as you? And the resounding no, (laughs) absolutely not. If they want to, cool. I think it's, you know, I think it's really cool on my end. I know you you have the same kind of situation with Drew. You know, Dan does diet. He does train. He does do all the same things that I do. Not to the extreme that I do, but he has in the past. He's done bodybuilding shows. He's done, you know, he was a wrestler. So he, he, he knows all that kind of stuff too. So he's been in those shoes before. But on a daily basis, on a daily basis, he trains just as hard as I do. We do walks together and cardio together every single day. He eats just like I do. He eats more than I do. And he eats a little bit different, like split than I do. But our lifestyles are very, very similar. Very, very similar in that regard. Um, So I do think that's helpful in that regard. I think one of the things that hinders a lot of people is when you're in a household where you're the only one doing it. And let's say you have kids or something. So you've got, you know, fruit snacks and granola bars and stuff like that in your house all day long. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for you to not indulge in that kind of stuff, you know? So in that scenario, as the loved one, you have a choice where you can help and support that person and say, okay, well, I'm going to get rid of the fruit snacks and the granola bars and things like that so that you don't have to see those every day. And I'm going to support you in this process, you know, and help you get through it and all this kind of stuff. Um, or you have to figure out a way so that they just don't feel tempted by you as well. I don't think, I don't, I don't know anyone that has gone into a competitive situation. I'm trying to think off the top of my head if I can think of anybody specifically who has told their significant other or their kids or something like that, that they have to eat the way that they do. I don't know of anybody that's ever done that. No, I, I don't. A lot of, a lot of the, the family members and stuff like that do again, just to support their, their loved one that's competing. A lot of them do it just to, just to be there and be supportive. What I found is that the athlete actually has a more difficult time when this than the family does. The family yeah, like, cool, 100%. whatever you want. And the athlete's like, no, I want to eat what you're having or like, right. I want up, you know, a lot of people or women's love language is making a meal for their yeah. family. Yep. And then 
feel like when they're in prep and they're unable to make a meal for their family that they can also eat too, this is a lot of psychology, that they're not fulfilling their love for them. Yeah. And I've been dealing with this a lot. I'm working with a lot of master's athletes right now with kids and yeah. they're, they're having trouble finding that balance. And I'm being vulnerable here with saying like, I don't know how to best support them because I don't have kids myself. So I allow them to all talk to each other and they're yeah. supporting each other and how they're doing different ways of you know, fixing their own mental approach to this and how they can still love on their family without those dinners and those foods. Um, but most of the time the family's like, you do you boo, you can go, mm -hmm. you can go, you know, eat your chicken and rice with us. We're going to still have spaghetti and meatballs though. Yeah. Yeah. And is the athlete okay with that? I mean, I, I've talked about this on the podcast before. I still have the photo of my very first prep. I'm sitting there eating ground beef and asparagus that I had five meals a day, my very first prep every single day. And Drew had us a big white pizza in front of him, chicken wings, ranch dressing, and the whole nine yards. I would never tell him that he couldn't do that. Right. Absolutely. Was yeah. it difficult? Yeah, absolutely. But I chose this. Right. And I can choose to sit here and eat my ground beef or I could choose in have that slice of pizza. Yeah. Um, some people do reach for the slice of pizza when they're in prep and then they get their macros. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> but again, it's, it's, it's all a choice. You know, yeah. I'm choosing to do this. And, you know, I tell my, my athletes all the time, like, before you start a prep is when you have that conversation with your mm -hmm. family. When they're coming to you and saying, hey, I'm getting ready to start a contest prep. The prep's going to be about 18 to 20 weeks. During that time, I cannot go out to eat. I'm going to be eating out of a Tupperware. This is what this looks like. This is how I'm going to feel. And giving that up front so they know where you're at and what to expect. And sometimes, too, even though you have that conversation, it will be 14 weeks in and your spouse comes to you and goes, I want to go out to eat with you. And it's hard. Yeah. It's very difficult because they forget that conversation and they're yep. putting you in the spot. And you also want to go out to eat with them, but you know, you can't. Now you're stuck in this, you know, this limbo yep. and it's hard. It's really, really hard to navigate. And something I've seen too, again, going back to the master's athletes with kids and stuff like that. A lot of times what they'll tell me is that their kids want to eat like them. Like they want to eat like mom and dad. You know, they want it, they want to be big and healthy and strong, you know? So a lot of times this actually will help instill better habits into your children. Like if they see you eating your, your chicken and your rice, they want chicken and rice. You know, I hear that a lot. It's like the parents don't, don't, um, restrict their children and tell them they can, again, can have the fruit stacks and the granola bars and things like that. But a lot of times those kids want to be just like you. They want to be healthy. They want to be big and strong, you know, all that kind of stuff. So for a lot of families, this can actually be a really good thing for the kids. Yeah. You know, I, I see know that from, all the time. Yeah. I know for myself growing up, like one of the best things that we had growing up is I grew up on a small farm. So like we had all fresh fruits and vegetables. We had fresh eggs. We had fresh meat. We like literally we had turkeys and pigs and stuff that we that we slaughtered. And that was our food. Like so unbeknownst to me. That was actually a very, very good way to grow up. My parents didn't do it on purpose. We did it because that's just that's just what we did. What you did. That's, that's just how, how life was, you know. But it actually made me a lot healthier growing up, you know. So some of the things that you do as, a, as an adult for your children in a contest prep can actually make them better. You can actually make them better. I feel like, again, going back to the marketing thing, I feel like, you know, instilling these kind of values onto your kids is better than what they see on TV during cartoons with like McDonald's and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. If the worst thing that your child sees is that you do an hour of cardio a day, you make time for your own training and that you're eating healthy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's just bad, saying. I, guess. Yeah. I know, right? That's terrible. So bad for you. <laughs> that's disordered eating, right? Right. It's but disordered. society. Correct. You know, so you have to go always go back to, I think, thinking about it from a standpoint of are we are we falling into a marketing trap or are we falling into a this is what we're actually supposed to be like as human beings. Right. You is know? it helpful or is it hurtful? Right. Mm -hmm. um, next one. We're getting close. We have a few more left here. <laughs> your face is sunken in. You're losing your boobs and butt. Um, yeah, this can be really hurtful as a female. Just just as an FYI. Like this happened uh, my uh, very first prep to me. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah, me. So it's not even my face. It's the, it's the losing the butt. My husband has said it several times and I've had to correct him several times because I lose my butt. And he's like, I like me when too. you're in off season because you have that nice round butt and a jiggly. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I get it. Me too. I'm like, but my stop. husband says that all the time. Yep. <laughs> yep. There'll be certain moments and he's like, all right, you're lean. You don't have your butt anymore. I'm like, 
But yeah, it's, it's part yeah, of it. One of so my, one of my very first preps, someone who I love very dearly, still in my life, love love her to death, and literally the sweetest woman in the world. Like would never mean anything malicious. Yeah, came up to me after I got done with my two and a half hours of cardio, and was like, Jordan, your face looks like a skeleton. Is this a part of the sport? And she meant nothing by it. She genuinely was curious, and I, I lost it. Because yeah. if she can come up to me and say something like that, imagine what other people were saying and just weren't coming up to my face and saying it. Yeah. Um, and it was, it, I remember it was, it was very hard for me. It was, it was very, very, very hard for me. And it's, and that wasn't even my family, you know? So imagine if this is your spouse, you know, someone that, you know, you have intimate moments with, like, it makes you so self-conscious. Mm -hmm. Like, again, there is no one more in tune with their body than us as bodybuilders. That's right. We know our boobs are sagging. We know our butt is going. We know our face looks like it's sunken in. We don't like it, but it's mm -hmm. a part of it. And That's we right. don't need the commentary that you notice it too. Right. <laughs> yeah. Trust us. Uh huh. Cause trust me, if you say it like, uh, you know, again, probably our husbands have said it one or two times and we've probably chastised them for it. So, you know, it, there's, there's, again, this goes back to ways to say it, you know, now my husband knows to say, just like you said, with the grabbing your butt, you're, you're ready kind of thing. He'll say, he'll say something to the effect of, Oh, I can really see it in your face. You're getting, you're getting close. Aren't you? That kind of thing. There's different ways of, of saying it. You know what I mean? Like, there's just different ways of saying it versus just saying, oh, you look like a skeleton, you know? Like, right. So, choose your words carefully, I guess. And just again, going back to what we said earlier, come from a place of love versus a place of, oh my God, you look like a skeleton. Yeah. <laughs> and the double, double standard, right? Would you go up to someone that gained right. weight and said, Yep. Wow, you lost your boobs because now all I see is your midsection. Yep. No, you would never say something like yep. that to someone else. You well, it's you know, and something we mentioned, I mentioned to you in the text when we were going through this too. I was like, I wonder if guys get the same kind of feedback. Like, I don't think anybody would go up to a man that's in contest prep and say, Oh, you've lost your butt. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think anybody would do that to a guy. They would do it to a girl, but they wouldn't do it to a guy. You know, and when we're talking about the face sunken in, they'd be like, Oh, your jawline is so strong you know, versus a female, oh, you look like a skeleton, you know, like, I think, I think we get different verbiage as females because we're supposed to be curvy and we're supposed to be round and we're supposed to have body fat and the men are not. So it's like for them, when they, when the men get into contest prep and men go through this, it's cool for us. There's something wrong with us. Correct. You know? It's praised. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So just something to think about as well in that regard. Um, next one is, are you really going to just sit at the dinner table and not eat or bring your Tupperware. So meaning like, are you just going to sit there and not eat versus, versus actually eating in front of everybody? I, I, I'm, I'm not a believer. If I've, if my family's eating, I'll sit and I'll, I'll watch if I've already eaten. But usually what I do is I try to communicate to them ahead of time. Like, when are you guys going to have dinner? And I'll plan my, my meal for that point in time so that I have mine to, to sit down and eat with them. It's very, very rare that I'll go to like a, a dinner and not eat anything. I usually, I usually plan my food at the same time. I would either, I would bring food or I would get something in my macros if I yeah. had enough. Um, or I don't go at all. I'll just be honest. Yeah. Like me going out and sitting at a dinner table in prep for me is very hard. Um, mm -hmm. It is extremely difficult. So I just try not to put myself in that situation. It's just something that I don't like to do. It's, it's, it's always been my thing. My family understands it now. If I'm in prep, I usually just don't want to go sit at the table if I'm not able to order something. Yeah. Um, I don't understand, again, family getting upset with bringing Tupperware to yes. meals. Again, I think this has to do with the psychology of a lot of parents find love in when their children eat their food that they make for them. So they feel like if my child's coming over and they're not eating my food, I'm not giving them love. Again, this is some sort of, you know, psychology type thing. Um, and, and again, it just goes back to why does it affect you so much that I'm still here with you, but eating out of my own Tupperware. Mm -hmm. um, the Tupperware comment gets made a lot in our industry yeah, with families. It um, it's not really something I quite understand. You know, with me and my family, um, I, got a, I got a very 
weird, crazy family. So no one has ever said something to me like this. I, I'm always the black sheep. So they're just like, oh, okay, she's doing something weird again. Here she's <laughs> bringing her own food. Uh, but a lot of people deal with this. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I just say, you know, again, it goes back to that conversation before prep starts. If we're going to have events, I'm going to be bringing my own food. And you just kind of try to set that up from the start. Um, and then maybe somebody that's watching this, again, that has that athlete that's competing, like, Really ask yourself, like, would you rather spend time with them and have them bring their own food or not eat at all or just not see them? Yeah. Because that's that's the latter. Yep. Um, so, again, we have to find a way to be able to have community and fellowship without the center of it being food. Yeah. Well, and something just a little hack that I do is if I'm going out to dinner or something like that and I've already eaten or whatever, you can always find a green salad. You can always find, you know, a side of green beans or broccoli or something like that. That's what I'll do. I'll order that. So as I have something in front of me that I can pick at while everybody else is eating, usually you can fit greens into your macro somewhere. It's like seven calories for like a cup of greens. You know what I mean? So if you do that, throw some lemon on there, some vinegar or something, and you're good. And then for me, that, that actually really works because then I'm participating but I'm not going off of my plan either. So, you know, that could be something that you could use as a little hack, just get a plain green salad, nothing on it, whatever. Or, you know, like, like I said, a side of, of green beans or broccoli or something like that. And that usually works. And then you see, then you're, yeah. then you're participating. You know what I mean? That's enough. And if that's not enough, then screw you. <laughs> not really. No, <laughs> not really. No. <laughs> uh. What are you eating? Here's another one. Um, so, so this one, so how did this one come in for, for the question box? What, what was there? Is it just like are people asking like what the actual food is or? My interpretation of this, because this one irks me too, okay. is people are so curious about our lifestyle when mm -hmm. they know that you're a bodybuilder that it's not just one person that's asking you what you're eating every day. It's multiple people. So yeah. when you are constantly hearing from your coworkers, your gym buddies, your family, your spa, blah, 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 what are you eating? And I'm probably eating the same freaking thing that I've been eating all day, every day. Yeah. And so it's just irking. And again, mm -hmm. I don't expect people to know this. They're yes. just genuinely curious and they're asking or trying to create conversation about the topic. But more than likely when you have, when you asked me this, I've already had five other people ask yeah. me this earlier in the day. Um, when I was prepping and I used to be in my gym 24 seven hands on, every single client that was on my book would ask me the same thing every mm. hour. What are you eating? What are you doing right now? How much cardio? And it's like, you're just repeating yourself. Yeah. So it just becomes annoying. Yeah. But again, I don't expect anyone to understand that. You don't know how many people have just asked me that. <laughs> and I, you know, on the other side of that too, like the way I think about it as well is like, I feel like they're asking me because they want to do the same thing, thinking it's going to have the same results. That is the other side of the coin. Absolutely. And I'm just like, it's not, but I'm like, you gotta understand I'm, I'm me and you're you like whatever, I, whatever I do is not going to work the same for you. You know what right. I mean? That's the part that annoys me. Like I, I'm like, just because I show you and that, and it's like, it's almost like you invited me because I'm trying to be open and I'm trying to be transparent about what I'm doing. And I'm, that's just me showing you what I'm doing. That doesn't mean that you should be doing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not telling you that because I eat like this, you have to eat like this. That's not what I'm saying. You know, I'm just saying this is an example of how it could look like. Right. right? So that's the way I look at that one. We're almost there. We got like three more. All right. Okay, good. Because I got a posing call. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're going, we'll go through these last ones. You're good. Um, I can't wait till you're fun again. I'm fun all the time. Guys, why, what, is, what is not fun? Like, I still do all the same, participate in the same activities. I still, again, we talked about all the food stuff. When I went to D.C. with my husband, we went and walked around the whole, you know, city, like sightseeing and things like that. I can do that in prep and off prep. What? I'm always fun. Because I think people's perspective <laughs> of fun is always food focused. It is. Focused, yeah, food you know? and alcohol. So it's, 100%. Yeah. And, and again, society, right? Like most mm -hmm. events are structured around food and alcohol. So it's also a challenge for you to, again, learn how to have a relationship with someone that's not food focused. Absolutely. And it can be a fun challenge too. Like you guys can, 
you know, go to museums, explore mm-hmm. the neighborhood that you've been living in for years. Like there's yeah. so many cool opportunities to see something different and have fun. Um, this is also on the athlete because mm-hmm. I can get like this too, where I'm just so laser focused. I don't want to go out. I'm tired, et cetera. Sometimes just getting there is the battle, you know? Yeah. So it's also about the athlete, meaning your family where they're at, you know, and not, not hindering yourself from every single moment in an event. And again, I, I relate to this. That's me. I, I can just hermit myself for an entire 20 weeks and be completely fine with that. But I still have a husband, a dad, yeah. friends, et cetera, that, that need my attention. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 again, it's about finding that balance on both sides. It needs mm-hmm. to be understanding from your loved ones, but you also have to understand and meet them where they're at too, because they want to spend time with you and they want to see you. So you have to bring some fun and dig deep. Yeah. Well, and I think also kind of find something that, that makes you want to go do things. Like for me, I'll, I, I go and I like find a cute outfit or something. Cause you know, when you're in contest prep and you start seeing everything pop and everything, like that's when you can start showing things off a little bit more. So that makes you want to go do do stuff like for me anyway that's my thing it's like if i if yeah. i go get like a cute little sundress or something that's gonna make me want to go out and like do stuff in it you know what i mean so find something that's going to make you want to be social whatever it may be yes. for me that's what works it's the cute little sundress or whatever that's what works for me find something that works for you that makes you want to go out and, and do that because you do you, you can't just say okay this is my thing and everybody else in my life you can screw off for the next you know, 20 weeks or whatever it might be. You can't do that or you'll have nobody left in your life. You know, they, they got it. They, they, you got to again, compromise, compromise. You don't have to have to be a hermit. You don't have to completely isolate yourself. You don't have to do any of those things. You have to be aware that the people that are supporting you in your life, you got to support them too. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Two more telling us how tired we look. We just said that. <laughs> We know. <laughs> we know. Hey, I, here's the other thing. I'm like, I look tired all the time, even when I'm not in prep, because I run my own business, man. We, we're, we're, we're always doing something. If we're not doing prep, we're doing something where we're, where we're taxing ourselves, our brain, our body, whatever. So I'm always tired. <laughs> yeah. I, I have... It's uh, genetically very dark bags under my eyes. So I always look tired too. People always say, every time I see my dad, whether I'm in prep or not, you look so tired. I'm like, I know. Okay. Have you ever gotten filler? I got filler done last year. It was the best thing I ever did. No, I, my, I have a very, very good uh, injector and she's like, you're not there yet. I'm like, okay. 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 I did mine last year because the same thing. I I have dark circles. You can't even see them. I have dark circles circles in my eyes just normally. And I got filler done last year underneath here. It made a huge difference. It looked like I I just overlook on Botox now. (laughs) I look like I I took like a 10 hour nap when I got done. I was like, oh my God, that was like the best, the best cosmetic procedure right there. So yeah, go get yourself some filler and then no Nobody will say you're tired. Yeah. <laughs> if you take last, anything away from today. All right. Our last one. Your ex speaks out. That's too long. And that's not enough, enough time. I was shocked by how many we got on this one. I was very shocked. So where I'm taking this one is because this has not happened to me personally, is that people are questioning your your and your coach's plan on how many awesome. weeks it's going to take to diet down for this show. So yeah. when people wait, you're going to be in contest prep for 16 to 20 weeks. I want everyone to really stop and pause and think about that for a second. It's just a few months to lose about 25 to 30 pounds for some people. 16, 18 weeks, it's really not that long time when you really start to think about how much weight the athlete is going to lose to get to that point. But to you, you hear that and it sounds like a very long time because again, most people can't stick to a diet and exercise program for more than a couple of weeks. So I think, you know, again, going back to what we've already talked about, your athlete has hired a coach and they have or should have a plan. Mm -hmm. And whatever that plan is, you have to remember that the coach is the professional for this case. If the coach says that the athlete needs 16 to 20 weeks to diet down, that's what the athlete needs. And I can promise you as a coach, I do not want my athletes suffering one more day than they have to. You think I like opening up those check-ins and hearing your athlete complain about how much hungry she is and how much cardio she's doing? The second that she looks contest lean, I am going to start feeding her and pulling back. Mm-hmm. I can promise you that. Yep. But we have to get to that point. first. 
Yep. And you have to realize you are not a coach and you're watching this because you know nothing about this sport. Yep. That's okay. Yep. You have to rely then on the professionals that they know what they're doing. Yep. And I think this, if I'm not mistaken, is coming from social media. So I think it's coming from friends. I think it's coming from girls that go into these Facebook and Reddit groups and say, I'm this many weeks out. How do I look? You are inviting that criticism. You're inviting that critique, right? I think that's where this is coming from. As an athlete, you don't have to put your progress out there. You don't have to, you know? So nobody should be giving you advice if you're not asking for it, right? If you're just in your regular everyday life, walking around in a t-shirt and pants, nobody's going to say you don't look lean enough or whatever it might be. If you're putting your pictures out there, if you're asking in these Facebook and Reddit groups, if you're asking your friends, if you're going, I know a lot of coaches, they have group chats with all of their clients. All the clients get into the group chat. They say, oh, well, you're not lean enough or you're going to be lean too soon or you're blah, blah, blah. They've got their little, you know, group chat among their friends that are all competitors and things like that. They're giving unsolicited advice. I hear this all the time. I hear this all the time because you're, you're going and checking, checking in with your friends and then your friends are giving advice, right? I don't think the friends necessarily mean anything bad by it. But you're asking for it as a competitor. You're asking for the advice. So you got to remember, like, if you're putting yourself out there for opinions, you're going to get opinions. So don't put yourself out there. You know, don't don't ask for it. Ask for the opinion from your coach. And that's it. Because I promise you, if you don't ask for it, people aren't going to say anything. Yeah. Or don't insert your opinion if not being asked. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. I'm sure that happens, too. I'm sure that happens, too. I'm sure people do just kind of vomit word vomit sometimes but I, I would guess that nine times out of ten it's because you're putting yourself out there and people are just automatically thinking that means you want you want advice right yes so you gotta remember if you're putting yourself out there people are going to give their opinions right they're gonna do it so you gotta know how to turn it off yeah you gotta know how to turn it off as a competitor so absolutely you know and if, and if they are if you aren't putting yourself out there then i don't know they're there's they're just digging on you anyway there's no reason there's no reason for somebody to say that to you i would never have a friend a family or friend come up to you and tell me i don't have to i have too long or not enough time or whatever because they don't understand it to begin with right you know what i mean like they don't understand what this what this takes anyway so they wouldn't wouldn't give that advice you know yeah. so that's my two cents if you have this you know if you have this happening to you it's likely because you're putting yourself out there right so if you're doing that, if you're putting yourself out there, remember, you're going to get it. You're going to get feedback back. You just got to remember to, to not listen to it <laughs> and, and listen to your coach. Right. Yeah. That's what I yeah. would say. So. Um, and that's our last one. We made it through all of them. Go us. That was like 14. It was a lot. <laughs> you saw there was more. Yeah. There was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, it just comes down to, I, hopefully that this, this podcast was helpful as far as for competitors or for, again, for your loved ones. And when we put this out there, you guys, what I'll do is I'll put out timestamps for each one of these questions. So if you have somebody that you're dealing with as far as one of these, these trigger uh, words or great phrases or whatever, you can click right to that timestamp um, and get on that. And uh, hopefully this will help you communicate a little bit better. So that was our, that was our goal with this, with this podcast. So we didn't get into our, into our own stuff this week. That's okay. Um, <laughs> the, this was long enough. Y'all had some great input. So, um, I know you've got to get onto a, onto a client call and I got to get this edited and get onto my client calls this afternoon. So, um, anything else you wanted to add before we close out for today? I don't think so. Thank you to everybody, though, that contributed mm -hmm. um, to the person that brought this topic up. And then when I put the question box out, Sean saw there was so many entries. And this was really good for us to also kind of see more mental head spaces and different perceptions and things like that. So I just appreciate everyone for contributing. I feel like this was definitely like a behind the bikini effort from all of us here. Yeah. as well. So it, it to me, this was a really, really, really special episode. Yeah, absolutely. We love this kind of stuff. So we tell you guys this all the time, bring us, bring us suggestions for, for topics, because this is the kind of thing that can come from it. And hopefully it's very helpful. It's something that you can put in your back pocket for when this stuff does occur during your in-season, on-season, whatever, or in-season, off-season, whatever it may be. And it, again, it's just going to be helpful for you going forward. And so they can help you um, succeed in the sport and help the people around you help you succeed in the sport too. So with that, you guys, this is episode 43. And uh, like, comment, subscribe, wherever the buttons may be. <laughs> and for Behind the Bikini, we will see you back here again next time.